see that? No, the, the Google. <laughs> or Jake, too. <laughs> Everyone gives me a hard time because I don't do Apple. <laughs> so there's a Google button. <laughs> You're leaving. <laughs> yeah, I am. I realize I'm in the minority on this, but that's okay. I don't care. <laughs> Does anyone else? I want to paint a picture here. Can you picture someone putting some bogus um, chili recipe online? And then saying, watch this, it says award winning. (laughs) 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 Oh man. (laughs) Yeah, it's Jake's Googling award winning chili rice. I love you, Jake. I really do. Jake. Jake is just, you are one of my favorite people, man. Okay, all right, we'll bring it, we'll bring it. We'll bring some. We got it, right, Ev? Okay, we got it. Okay, let's open up in prayer, and then uh, I got a few things I want to start off with. Um, Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come up and minister. I don't take this lightly, and I thank you, Lord, that, uh, uh, that the hearts of everyone in here are ready to receive the word. I thank you, Lord, that no obstacle of the enemy is allowed in this place, on this ground. We take authority over it right now. We take authority of every weapon that is formed against us. It will not prosper in any way. I thank you, Lord, that as I minister, not my words, but yours, that the hearts and ears of everyone are open, that blind eyes, deaf ears are open, revelation manifests. Thank you, Lord, that miracles manifest in here and people's hearts are pierced with revelation from your word. A good piercing of your word. We give you all the glory and ask you to take over this whole message. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I'm going to start off, I'm going to preface with two points. Number one, I do own another shirt for ministry, okay? (laughs) So, (laughs) which leads into my second point, okay? I want to tell you... (laughs) Zach, my son, he actually said this once in the car because we were just coming for service and I wore this shirt. He's like, Dad, are you ministering today? I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, why do you think that? I didn't even catch it. Abby was like, because you always wear that shirt when you preach. I was like, well, it's anointed. Uh, <laughs> never wash it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yes, exactly, right? <laughs> And so that leads into this other one, because I'm so excited about this message tonight. Um, this was a message, I'm going to give you just a little snapshot of, um, of yesterday for me, okay? So yesterday, I, well, let's backtrack a we- about a week. About a week ago, I am getting, um, I'm, I'm just doing stuff around the house. All of a sudden, it was like, an entire message dropped in my heart. And I've never really had that happen. I've had it where I'm like, I really want to preach on that if I ever get the opportunity or different topics. But this was like bullet pointed everything about a week ago. I, but I was like, I don't even have a message scheduled. So I'm like, I don't know why I got that. Then, then yesterday, I'm driving uh, on my way to Hot Springs. And uh, on my way, all of a sudden, the Lord comes to me and says, be ready with that message. And I was like, Okay, like I don't know why, you know, because I still don't have anything even close to scheduled. And then Mona messages me yesterday, and she's like, hey, is there any chance you can minister tomorrow? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, you have no idea. I'm so excited. And so this message is something that um, um, I am re- I'm really excited about this one, okay? We're going to start with a scripture because we're going to open it up um, with Proverbs 23.1. And we're going to do some note-taking. So if you're a note-taker, I have this uh, kind of bullet-pointed in a way. So, um, wait a minute. Not Proverbs 23, 1, Proverbs 22, 1. That one makes no sense. Right? Did that go up? It had to do with eating? Okay. (laughs) Okay, if you're looking in your Bible, it's Proverbs 22, 1. Okay? (laughs) Sorry, Adam. All right, 
It's cool how the Bible is, is laid out. There's, you can do anything with, with just the Bible. You, if, you like, um, if you like doing devotionals, it has a 31-day devotional built into it. If you, want, if you are someone who likes to do confessions and, and pray over things, it has 150 prayers in the book of Psalms. If you like history, it's in there. If you like love stories, it's in there. It's amazing how the Bible is laid out. And so I was doing uh, this devotional yesterday, and this was, and it's funny because this is a message, or this was part of the message already. <clears throat> and so, um, and so yesterday I flip open, and sure enough, that's what the verse is. So twenty-two one, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Actually, well, it's on the New Living. I'm sorry. Choose a good reputation. That not that one. We can go back to NLT. Thank you. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. What I want to talk about tonight is legacy. What is your legacy going to be on the earth? What, is, what are you, and, and not, just, not just on the earth, I want to, actually I should change that. Not just on the earth, but what are you going to be remembered for when you get to heaven? What is it that you're doing now that when you cross over, because we all will, what is it that you're going to be remembered for? What are people going to come up to you for in heaven and say, man, thank you so much for filling the gap? And if there's nothing, that's fine. That's a place to start. Let's go ahead and start there and build, okay? We don't have, we shouldn't be so afraid of having to start somewhere, okay? It's not, that's not a bad thing. If you have nothing, okay. Now you know where you are. Let's move forward. Okay? But we have too many people that are living, in my opinion, we have too many people living on autopilot. Okay? And what I mean by that is they go through the day-to-day, and um, every day is sort of the same. They, they start blending together. Uh, Pastor always talks about this where he's like, what are you living? Are you living for that? Vaca- are you living for a vacation? Are you li- like, what is it that that's there that you're like, I'm excited about this? I love that that message. And um, and, th- and that in between is that autopilot. If you remember, um, I did a message about two months ago, I think it was, uh, where we talked about the um, the dots in your life, the red, the orange dots. If you remember that, if not, it basically just a snapshot of it is an orange dot uh, represented. I wrote it on the whiteboard. An orange dot represents like those pivotal moments in your life where there is a crushing decision that can actually change the course of your life. What you do there changes everything. And when you get to that point, it you you're that that's it. That's actually autopilot. Okay, that's where autopilot really kicks in. What's inside, right? Pastor Evan talks about this as well. What is, when you're squeezed, it's about what, it, something's coming out, right? It doesn't matter, like, what, you, what happens in that moment is going to be a, what's, what's going to happen after that is a result of what happens in that moment. So our job is not to wait for those moments and then be ready. It is to prepare ahead of time and make sure that when we are squeezed, good stuff comes out. Now let me tell you something, and I wasn't even necessarily going to go here, um, but I want to tell you, you know, let's think about what happened a week and a half ago, right? Well, everyone who was here. I want to tell you something that might be an encouragement, because sometimes it's easy when... When you're reading messages, when you're reading the Bible, or you're listening to sermons, and you're like, "Man, I need to correct that. I need to correct that." And it, you know, there's things that come up, and you're like, "I need to work on that," right? <clears throat> and so, there's times where it feels like, like if you get in your own head, or if you let the devil in, you start feeling like, "Man, I'm not adding up," right? Can I tell you that there is there's a little girl alive today, and why is she alive? Because God moved. Why did God move? Because the church prayed. And why did the church pray? Because they were built up and ready to go when the time came. That was an orange dot for Beyond Church. That was one of those snap out of autopilot. It doesn't, you, you're not going to, to make something happen in that moment. What's happening is going to happen, right? And isn't that amazing that what happened was a little girl's life was saved because of the church praying? Right? And I saw everyone just snapping to it. It was amazing. 
It was amazing. I have never been more proud of this church. So the good news is we already had an orange dot and we already passed it. So that means what we're doing is working. What pastors are preaching is working, <laughs> right? You're in the right place because she shouldn't be here and she is, right? So the good news is you're not starting from zero. You're starting from a very solid foundation, okay? But what we need to do is make sure that we stay off of this autopilot mode. And it's easy in the in-betweens when there's nothing quote-unquote exciting happening, if I can use that phrase, you know what I mean by that. When there's nothing exciting happening, something that snaps us out of it, then what are we doing during that time? That is where you find out what kind of Christian you are, is during the in-between. What do we do? Are we consistent? So we're going to talk about that. Um, let's turn real quick to Matthew 19.24. Let's hope that's the right verse this time. <laughs> And um, actually, let's go back just a little bit. Mm. We're going to talk real quick about the rich young ruler. Go back to verse 16, please. Matthew 19, 16, if you don't mind. You're awesome. All right. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Now, this was the rich young ruler. This is a person who has dedicated his life, apparently, to material wealth. Okay? So he came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Right? So he's already kind of coming from the wrong place. Right? We can see that. What do I have to do? What is it going to take? I can, I can buy anything I want, right? People do what I command whenever I say to do it because, you know, one of those kind of people. I, I, that's what I'm picturing. I'm kind of filling in the gaps here a little bit. Um, but that's what I picture. He's probably maybe a little arrogant, a little overconfident in his wealth. It's easy to get there. Jesus says, why ask me about what is good? She said, there's only one who is good, but to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments, okay? He's, he's messing with them. Jesus does this a lot. You know, Jesus, if you can plug, like, Robert Downey Jr. into Jesus every now and then, <laughs> I picture it just a little bit, you know? Some of those interactions with the Pharisees, like, he's hilarious, okay? Jesus has a few moments where he, like, where he just... He messes with them in such a way. They, like, ask him a question, and he says, hold on, let me ask you a quick question. He asks them, and they know that they're trapped, so they say, we're not going to answer, and he's like, all right, then I'm not going to answer. And so Jesus is awesome with this, okay? But he says, um, so the man asks, which ones? Jesus said, you must not murder, commit adultery, must not steal, must not testify falsely, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments. I'm going to go with pride on this one, but that's fine. The young man replied, what else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Okay? A lot of people stop there. A lot of people stop there when you hear messages on the rich young ruler, a lot of traditional messages on the rich young ruler. People stop there, and they, they start attacking, you know, material wealth and all that kind of stuff, okay? Let's go to the next verse, though. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I'll tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It's easier for an, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, to us, in our, in our modern-day vernacular, we would look at that and say, you know, an eye of a needle and a camel, right? I guess it's not good to be rich, right? No, that's not what it's talking about. The eye of a needle was a physical location during that time. What it was was it was a... It, it was, it was a gated area. Think of, think of a wall surrounding this community, and it was very heavily fortified. And in order to get through this place that was called the Eye of a Needle, the camel had to take all the baggage off, get down on its knees, and then get under 
this place called the eye of a needle, okay? That was what this is referring to. He's referring to the physical location called the eye of a needle. What he's saying is a lot of people are going to trust in something that they shouldn't be trusting in, okay? That's what he's talking about. So they won't let go of that baggage and they're never going to bow their knees, right? Bowing your knees to the Lord is what will get you to that place of destiny that you're called to. You cannot get to the place of destiny that you are called to be at, and every person in here has a destiny that you are called to, but you won't get there through your own works. It is impossible. Impossible. And any success that, that you, myself, all of us have had by our own works, is not part, is, that's not our destiny. You're, that's not living our destiny, okay? Sometimes this is a sobering message. And understand, like I said, what Jesus is saying, it's harder, he's saying for a rich person who is very much, you know, this person's trusting in, in what they have, they're not gonna bow their knees. They don't bow to anyone, right? Because I'm the one people bow to. He's a ruler. He's not just rich. Let's not forget that part, right? Sometimes we think of the rich part. He's also a ruler. He does not, bow to people. People bow to him. So when Jesus is saying, bow to me, that's what he was telling him. When he's saying, bow to me, he's like, I don't think so. I don't bow to anyone. Does that sound similar to some mentalities in today's world? I don't bow to anyone. I don't submit to anyone. Okay, well, then you're never going to fulfill your destiny. It's impossible because you have to submit to the Lord in order to get there. And if you're not submitted to the Lord, and when I say submitted to the Lord, I'm talking he directs your steps. What do you want me to do? What is it, Proverbs 3, 5? Trust in the Lord with all, your, or with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Right? Okay. Now, on the flip side, there is nothing more important than figuring out what the Lord has for you. There's nothing you're doing right now in your life that's more important than figuring out what God's calling you to do. What if, what if you've spent your entire life on this career path, and the whole time God was saying, go here, and now God's saying, I called you here, right? Right? It's about who you're bowing to. If you continue on that path, knowing that the Lord is calling you to something else, then who are we submitted to? Right? That's a hard thing to hear. The, only, the thing is, though, is that true riches and honor on this life and that life, that's found in submitting to the Lord. That's where you get that. Okay? See, um, yeah, I've got time. You, so, Mona, I have to be done at 8.15, right? But it says 19.24, so I've got like 10 hours. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just. I know military time, I'm just joking. <laughs> Everyone down here would be like, what a northerner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so it's all about who are we who are we kneeling to, right? It's about having him direct our steps in every area of our life. If there's an area you're not submitted to the Lord, I would challenge you to turn that over to him. Okay? God deals with the whole person. He doesn't just deal with, with the surface. So here's what we think, okay? We think, and this is very easy. I'm talking to myself, by the way. I want you to understand that. This message was to me first. So if you're like, man, he's, I'm first on this list, okay? But it's very easy to get to this point where you're like, if I just made this much money, right, then... I would have time to read the Bible, right? 
I'm going to ask you, because I know that there are people in here, right? I know there are people in here. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anyone. But I know that there are people in here that have made that much money. And I bet you a million bucks the Bible still didn't take first place. You know why? Because with this much money comes this much pressure. So now, to get to where I want to be, I actually now need this much money. If I just had this much money, then I'll read the Bible. Right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. There's no magical number that if I just got to this, you understand that there are, there are people in here that feel that they're in poverty, and there are people in here that probably feel like they're very wealthy. And there's everywhere in between. And it's very easy to look at people who are in wealth, monetarily, and say, see, if I was just like them. You know, they might say, if I was just like, if I just didn't have this pressure, right? You know what's interesting? I, when I first got saved, the first job I got at our church up in Minnesota was to be a janitor, okay? I was a janitor for three years. Now, in my mind, I was going to be a janitor for like a year, and then they were going to make me pastor. <laughs> Absolute truth, right? Absolute truth. I kid you not, okay? Huh? Yeah. Pastor Matt. Yeah, yeah, instead of Mac. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Not Pastor Mac. They just misspelled it, right? <laughs> right? I promise you, that was my thinking, okay? I was a very foolish Christian to start with, okay? And praise God for people up there that had mercy on me and trained me, okay? <laughs> and so, but I started out as a janitor. Now, I worked as a janitor for three years. And after I, became, after I went from that, and I, I won't get into the whole details of it, but I'll tell you that the Lord did some amazing things, and he humbled me. I got to this point where, because I, I, that was what I was expecting on the first year, first year anniversary, I'm like, okay, when's this door opening? Well, by the end of the second year, I'm like, well, this stinks, you know? And so I don't want to be a janitor, right? That was what I was thinking. I'm like, I don't want to do this, you know? I was just doing this because I figured I would be promoted. At the end of my... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right motivation, isn't it? Yeah. The end of my, of my, uh, after that, when I went into my third year, something changed in my heart. The Lord spoke to me like he'd never spoken to me before. And he had to because I was on work probation due to my attitude, for real. And so, <laughs> and so he had to get in the middle of this a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It was well-deserved, I promise you, <laughs> okay? It was not my boss's fault. I look back, and I'm like, I would have fired myself. Like, I don't, and so, um, <laughs> this is truth. I'm just telling you, this is my testimony, okay? So on the third year, I was sitting on our porch, and I was reading the Bible, and uh, he was talking to me about Joseph. I was reading Joseph, and that's one of my favorite characters of all time. And when I was reading about Joseph, you look at how long he was in this prison, and he didn't even complain. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. When he was told he's going to be this promised rescuer of his family, then he gets sold into slavery. And then he's there for a long time, does the right thing, gets thrown into jail. And he's in there. The whole process lasts like 13 years. 13 years. And he never complains. And God says, and, and so when I'm reading this, the Lord's just speaking to my heart about this. It just really is hitting home. And he was showing me, you know, Joseph would have stayed there forever if I wanted him to. And so the Lord said, how long are you willing to be a janitor if that's what I've called you to do? And I got to this point in my, I, it, was in, it was a heart change. It wasn't like, I'll do this and knowing like, you know, I really want to still be promoted, but I'm going to try to trick God. It was a, it was in the heart. I'm like, I got to this point where I'm like, I will be a janitor forever. If this is what I'm called to do, then praise God, I'm going to do it the best. I'm going to be the best janitor that ever lived, okay? Two weeks after that, I get called to get a promotion, yeah. Yeah. not to pastor. <laughs> so, but I get a promotion. It was a huge promotion, okay? I, it was a promotion 
And I'll, I'll just say this, it, it was a promotion, and if you guys know who Pastor Mac and Lynn are, then, then you know what that church is. This was a promotion to the point, and this came to me. I did not go to it. it call, they called me out of the blue two weeks later, and it was a promotion where I was going to be working with Pastor Mac and Lynn personally on some things, right? Amazing. Amazing, and, they, and this was called to me. I, I kid you not, two weeks after I changed my heart, but I was willing to be a Met Jenner forever. So fast forward a few years, okay? Now I'm living in Arkansas. I work at a bank, if you don't know that. Worked my way up from, you know, different things. The Lord opened up doors. Got to the point of branch manager, okay? I was running my own branch for a while. And uh, you know what's funny is that there were times, there were a lot of times actually, when I was, being, when I was a branch manager. All this responsibility, things were great, doing great. There were a lot of times where I was like, Gosh, I wish I was just a janitor again. I missed that. I missed, be, I missed having none of this responsibility and being able to just be, listen to the Lord all day. Just I could t- put in headphones. I could spend time with him. It was at church, so part of my job was going to church. It was awesome. And I think back on it. At the time, I was like, if I could just get out of this, right? I'm telling you that, that when you do get out of it, there's going to be a time where you're going to miss that. You're going to say, man, that was just easier, (laughs) you know? Because as responsibility increases, because we should be going from glory to glory, as responsibility increases, you start to miss the times when you didn't have that weight, right? I went so far off my notes, it's not even, it's not even funny. I don't even know what, this was supposed to be like a note-taking thing. (laughs) Remember when I said, get out your notebooks? Well... All right, now get them out. <laughs> I just, I, I feel like there's people in here that are like, I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck, I, I'm so frustrated, and I just wish that I could get a breather. There's n- the breather is not the result of your paycheck. The breather is the result of spending time in the Word and getting to know God. That was what changed for me, by the way. Notice that, that God spoke to me when I was in the Word. Because that second year when I was really offended and frustrated, I wasn't spending that much time in the Word, yeah. right? Yeah. All of a sudden, I start spending time in the Word, God's talking to me, and hey, wouldn't you know, it works out, yeah. right? That's the solution to every problem, yeah. individually and, and globally, might I add, yeah. Right? Your answer, I'm going to tell you this, and, and I'm, I'm, your answer is not a political solution. It's not a political party. It's not, there's no magical person that's going to come through and fix it. There's a magical person that's going to come through and fix it for about three and a half years, if you read Revelation. <laughs> One person, that's the Antichrist, right? That's the only person that comes through and brings peace for a short time. It doesn't last, Right? There's no person. We got to stop putting our trust in the world's stuff. You got to ask yourself sometimes, and I have to do this too, because I'm a very politically minded person. I enjoy that. Just, but you know, there have been a lot of times the Lord's had to tell me to hang that all up and be like, "You got to stop. You got to take a break." And um, we got to ask ourselves: Is what I'm doing to solve this problem the same thing that an unbeliever would do? to solve this problem, because if it is, I'm probably doing the wrong thing, right? So if you're like, I'm not making enough money, I just need to go get a second job, hold on. Is that what everyone else would do if they're not saved? Because if you're a Christian, that's not your source. In Bethel Church, I like to listen to um, Pastor Bill Johnson. Actually, his son, too, is absolutely amazing. Um, But I love listening to, to Bethel. I feel like he just has this amazing perspective on things. And he has done, been doing a series, it's called The Upside Down Kingdom. And I love that concept. He says, uh, in, order to, um, in order to be healed, you stand in faith. In order to be prosperous, you need to give. In order to find solutions, in order to win a war, you need to get on your knees. It is all opposite with the Lord. So if whatever we're doing is what the world would do, then we're doing the wrong thing. Because that is not your solution. Because in every obstacle, 
The goal as a Christian is that the Lord gets the glory. And he doesn't get the glory when you do what a world, worldly person would do. Not to be mean, I'm just saying that's not the solution. And, and we have a lot of people who look up you know, all of these, these great stats on how to do this and how to do that and what's the, what are the five steps. The, the, the one step is get on your knees. That's the one step. Let's pray. That's, your, that's the one step. Well, and get in the word. But you can do that on your knees. You know, it's the same thing. <laughs> okay. So we're still talking, <laughs> theoretically, about legacy, right? This is all really tying back together to how are you going to fulfill what God's called you to do, right? It's just taking a massive detour. Okay. Um. Let me tell you this, and, you know, we've lived down here for, uh, for almost seven years now, and um, I'll tell you that I, I fell in love with Arkansas immediately. I just loved it here. I love the people. I love, I love, I love a lot about this state, and, um, and you know, I'll, I'll tell you that, that I never totally felt at home in Minnesota. I really felt at home when I came here. Um, and so, um, um, even though Daryl always calls me a Yankee, and so, <laughs> and so, um, and let me tell you, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite things about Arkansas is I love the fact that, you know, if it was five o'clock, six o'clock in the, in, in the evening, everyone's sitting down to eat, eat dinner. And if we were out on the road going who knows where, and we were like, I left the stove on. There are probably 50 people I could call right now in this church. I could say, I left it on, and every one of them would put down dinner and go turn off that stove. That's not the case everywhere, okay? That's an amazing thing. People look out for each other here. I'll tell you that one of the things that I would be cautious of that we have to be careful of here is that sometimes we get to this place of complacency where we're like, all I need, right? All I need is my truck, my whatever. We, we know, we, we talk about it, right? That's all I need, and then I'm satisfied. That's all I need. I don't need to be rich. I don't need to be blah, blah, blah. I just, I just want a simple life. That's not bad, but it will lead to not being able to help anyone. It leads to this perspective of, it's really about me. I just want to be happy and satisfied. And that leads to a, that can lead to a scary place. Because pretty soon, I'm afraid of anyone, you know, messing with my life. Because I, I, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Here's the thing. And this is, this is one of the things that the Lord spoke to me um, a while ago, and I just feel like it's very fitting for right now. The goal in life is not to be happy. That's not your goal. Right. Happiness, joy, and it's not, not even happiness. Joy, which is separate. Joy is spiritual. Happiness is, is soulish, okay? Joy can only come through the fulfillment in the word through doing what God's called us to do. That's the only way joy comes. It doesn't come through trying to find, you know, what, is the, what, what do I want to do, right? And we've seen how that's worked, right? What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? That's, you know what I mean. <laughs> if you don't know what I mean, then probably better. <laughs> All right. That was that. <laughs> that was <laughs> Chad, I'm going to use this for the second time. Second time you set this up and second time I'm using it. Other than the other three times you lifted this thing all the way up here and I didn't use it at, the, at all, which I'm sorry again. Okay. Uh, 
how do I want to do this? Okay. I want you to picture that... Sorry. <laughs> I want you to picture... It's always you. <laughs> Just kidding. You're awesome. Okay. <laughs> so, I, want, um, I want you to picture that this outer, this outer line is, that this is, really I want you to picture this whole thing is a makeup of, um, of who you are to the core, okay? All the way down. There's levels to a person, okay? This outer level, and this is, this is how, I want you to view this as where you're living your life from. Let's word it that way, okay? So the outer level, we're going to call this the flesh, okay? And I, not, I don't just mean... I don't just mean in the spiritual sense when we talk about the flesh of living worldly. I'm talking who you physically are, okay? This is like the first level of who you are as a person, right? It's um, I'm a male, I'm a female, I'm whatever, okay? Really basic things. Well, we'll get into that, okay? The next level here we're going to say is the soul, okay? Okay? So, which I put it a little high, but this line, that's the soul, okay? So the soul is your mind, your will, and emotions. This is where you have opinions. This is where, this is what gets um, really trained when you're young, okay? Your soul is generally trained when you're young, okay? And then here, we have our spirit. But... I want to break this almost into two categories, okay? But we'll get into that. Every part of this has been under attack by the enemy. Every part of who you are, from the core up. The devil, he hates us. The reason he hates us is because we remind him of God, right? What did, he, what did, what did God say in the garden? Let us make man in our image, we are the only being created in the image of God. That's it. Not only that, but you want to think about something really crazy. And it's just a side note. Study this out for yourself. When Jesus came to the earth, was he a man or was he God? He was both, right? He was a man as well. He lived in a, in, in a, in a physical body, right? When he died... And rose again when he was, was he, was he a human, let's say, at that time? Yeah, he was risen as a man, right? So here's what's the crazy thing. Then he ascends to heaven. Here's what's really amazing about this story. Do you realize that right now, as we're talking, there is a man on the throne of God? That's crazy. One of the Godhead, one of the Trinity is now a man. He became a man, but when he rose, he was still a man, right. and now he's sitting on the throne. That's pretty amazing. Yep. So right now, one-third of the Trinity is, 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 is man. That's us, right? That's unreal. There's no, no existence anywhere in the universe that can claim that. That's how much, that, that's amazing. Um, okay. So the soul, this is, where, so this is where we make our decisions from. A lot of this has to do with how we grew up, and this is where we start making choices from and where we decide who we are, who we want to be. What kind of person am I, right? What did my family do? Family has a lot to do with this, right? The spirit is that recreated person, okay? Now the spirit, it, I want to almost split how you, the spirit is, is that we're going to keep that, but how you live in the spirit can come in two ways, okay? You can live in the body of Christ and serve but never feel fulfilled. And that's because we're not really getting to the core of who did God say I am. I'm just kind of plugging in, right? It doesn't produce long-lasting results. When you get to the core of who you are, and you say, God, who am I? 
Who did you create me to be? That can only come through revelation, right? It can only come through reading the word. How did Jesus figure out who he was? Very first action he takes when he walks into that synagogue, if you remember that, I'm not going to get into that story here, he opens up the book of Isaiah, and he reads from it. And then when he gets done, he closes it and says, this day, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, that's me, right? Where did he get that from? He read the Bible, and he looked at it, and he said, this is who I am. And then he lived it out. And he was so committed to who he was called to be that he let nothing interfere with it, even desperate need. Guys, there were, there were thousands of people. What, the woman with the issue of blood, right? If you know that story. Jesus is actually going to Jairus' house to raise his daughter from the dead. On his way, he has all these people pressing in, and the woman with the issue of blood touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed. He stops and says, who touched me? And they say, How? you know, we know that there's a lot of people because the disciples are like, what do you mean who touched you? Everyone's around. How many of those people had needs? He didn't just stop. He wasn't moved by need. Yeah. It's very easy to be moved by need because there's a lot of it. Yeah. That doesn't move us. We're moved by the Spirit of God. Only. If you're moved by anything else, then that's your source. Okay? So I want you to picture that in order to live your life, you need to be pulling from one of these sources, okay? If you pull from the flesh, then you're, I mean, most people don't do that. They're, although today there's even an attack on that. Who am I as a physical person? It doesn't really get any more ridiculous than that, to be honest with you. But, but we're even attacked on that. This is where a lot of people live their lives. And this is the only place that you can live your life if you're not saved. Because your spirit isn't reborn, okay? So this is a part where you're, you're living your life and it's based off these emotions, off of opinions. It's a dangerous place to live. The reason it's dangerous is because that changes all the time. That's relevant, right? If I feel like I should do this, then I'm just going to do it. You're not, there's nothing solid holding you down. Then we get to the spirit and we can live in two realms on that, right? We can live and be a, be a Christian, and that's great. But, but I, I'm willing to bet, if I ask for a show of hands, that there are Christians in here that would say, I don't feel fully fulfilled. I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm called to do. That's because you haven't gotten to this, the core. This can only come through revelation. This will impact everything all the way up. If If you used to believe a certain way and now you've read in the word and you've studied and you know that God feels a different way about it and you change that opinion, that's called renewing your mind. That is living from the spirit, okay? That's how we live from the spirit. We let the word decide our opinions. We let the word decide where are we serving, right? The word says to serve, correct? We're supposed to be plugged in, prospering within our church, right? So we know we're supposed to be in here. Now, we just use different terms nowadays, but this is talking about being on the B team, right? Being, being involved, right? It's, but you can go in an even deeper level, and now you can get to know God, and you can say, where on the B team, or where do I serve? What, where is my calling where I'm taking this, and now it's flooding everything? where I can impact the most, but you got to spend time in the Word to get to this. This will come by default. You already have this. This will come through spending time in church, but this, that only comes through spending time with the Lord. Only. Only He can tell you who you're called to be. Only Him. There's no human on earth that can tell you that. So if you're waiting to come to church and have someone minister and say, here's who you are specifically, you're going to be waiting a long time, and you're going to be unfulfilled, which there are a lot of people who are. Now, here's what's cool. And again, this is a big A-plus for Beyond Church. 
You know that the statistic is that, the, that in the average church, only 4% of the church serves in any capacity? 4%. At Beyond Church, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a lot because our B team barely even fits in the sanctuary anymore. So that's cool. That's awesome. Again, you're, you're in a good place. <laughs> you're starting off on a good start. But let's take it another step. If you're, if you're serving, if you're plugged in, if, if you're starting to change some of those, those mindsets of, I used to believe this way, but you know what? I realize that's not the right way to believe. I need to change that. If you're getting to that point, let's take it that one last step. Who is God calling you to be? Where are you supposed to serve? And if it's not where you are now, change it. It's so simple. It's so simple, but it's not easy, right? Because sometimes we've been entrenched in something for a long time. All right, with my remaining... <laughs> did, you, did you change the clock? <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> now I have no excuse, Mona. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about two ways to live life. And I've got 20 minutes or so. So let's spend 10 minutes on each because <laughs> that's all I have left anyways. <laughs> so, okay. Let's talk about the wrong way to live life. Okay, I'm going to give you some examples, an example, okay? So many of you all, if you know anything about history, and you weren't getting away that easy, so yeah, if, if some of you guys are like, he might have forgotten, no, no, I don't forget. I start with a history lesson and then build the sermon off of that, okay? How many of you all, I, I, this one I do want to show of hands, raise your hands if you've ever heard the name Benedict Arnold. How would you love that legacy? Everyone raises their hands, and it's because you're known as a traitor, <laughs> right? So let's talk about Benedict Arnold's life for just a minute, because it's actually very, very fascinating, okay? Benedict Arnold was born into a very prosperous household. It all, it, it, and I'm not, this is not a joke. It all started, <laughs> right, when he was young. I know that you're thinking like, oh gosh, this is going to take a long time. But he, it started when he was young. Benedict Arnold was born into a very prosperous household, but he had an alcoholic father who basically got rid of all their savings, everything they had. They ended, he ended up pretty well destitute. So Benedict Arnold, and this is one of the keys to this story, Benedict Arnold went out to set a name for himself because he did not want to, uh, uh, he, could, he, he didn't want to be remembered by what his father did. So he joins the military, and he's actually a brilliant, a brilliant uh, commanding officer. Did you know that the way we fight war today, the way we fight war today came from Benedict Arnold? It, was, it started in, in Saratoga when he, when he decided, you know what, we shouldn't be facing them head on. Let's get in the, in the, on the side and start using sniper rifles to, to get people, okay? That was his, his brainchild. That was, that was Benedict Arnold. Okay, so he, he starts off, the revolution's kicking off, and there is one base that is extremely well fortified. It's called Ticonderoga. It is the most fortified thing, and if you know anything about history, you know that this base, this is like one of those pivotal things. So Benedict Arnold decides, I'm going to go get that base, and he, that he's going to make a name for himself. He's already kind of a, he's a commanding officer, and, but he's gonna, he goes up by himself, and he figures he's going to find people along the way in order to take this base. Gets up there, runs into Ethan Allen, which is the Green Mountain Boys. Ethan Allen is the complete opposite. Benedict Arnold is like a very polished, he's trying to make a name for himself. So he wants to look very refined, very polished, right? He looks very professional. Ethan Allen is the absolute opposite, right? He wears like the, the raccoon, <laughs> right? With the raccoon hat and swears and is, is always drunk. But his Green Mountain Boys... Benedict Arnold needs them. So here's what happens. Benedict Arnold says, I want, we're going to go take Ticonderoga, and Ethan Allen says, yeah, that's where we're going too. 
and Ethan Allen can't stand Arnold. So he says, I'm leading. And Arnold is like, no, no, you're not. And well, all of the Green Mountain Boys say, well, we're not listening to you. So they, they follow Ethan Allen, and, and, and Arnold has no point but to follow. So they easily win Ticonderoga because uh, they weren't expecting an attack. They were literally sleeping when they walked in. <laughs> they literally just pushed open the door, and they were all asleep, and they, literally, they surrendered immediately. And so there wasn't even a shot fired. Um, and so, but Ethan Allen writes back and says, we won, but he gives no credit to Arnold, okay? So here we go. Arnold starts off trying to make a name for himself, right, because he's mad at his dad. Now, offense number one. I was the one who went up here, right? And no one gave me any credit. Let's fast forward a few years. Battle of Saratoga, huge battle, very important. I'm not getting into the battle. The point of the matter is, is that Horatio Gates, which was the, the, the leader on the, um, uh, uh, on the, continent, uh, the, the American side, is making a lot of stupid choices. And so Arnold decides to take his men and start trying a different weapon, a uh, different tactic, which is what we use today, and won the war, won the battle, at great cost himself, by the way. He got shot in the leg, it dropped his horse, and he almost died. The horse rolled over him. So he had great personal injury, and then Gates takes all the credit for himself. <laughs> Strike number three, okay? Mind you, Arnold was kind of, kind of a jerk, though. He was really arrogant. So... It, there's a reason that everyone keeps, like, <laughs> pushing him aside. So then, final thing. This is the last nail in that coffin. Arnold is doing some things that everyone's doing at the time, but they're not less necessarily morally accurate, or morally right. And the people start coming against Arnold and accusing him of actually being, uh, of empathizing with the, with the British, they accuse him of being a Tory, which was like the biggest crime you could say. They started attacking his character because of some friendships he has. And Joseph Reed, who was in charge of, of Pennsylvania at the time, which is where Arnold was, starts bringing him to court. He wants him to go to court. Arnold asks George Washington for help because he's like, you know my character, right? I want you to think about this. He's putting his trust entirely in Washington, okay? He's like, you know my character, you know who I am. Will you please stand up for me? Joseph Reed sends a letter at the same time and says, if you do anything for Arnold, you're not getting any supplies. And they were at a point where if they didn't get supplies, the war was over. They were getting crushed. Washington desperately needed Pennsylvania's help. So Washington, against what he wanted to do, has to side with Reed, which crushes Arnold. And that's when Arnold sides with the British at that point. Little did he know Washington was about to promote him as, a, as, a, as an apology and explain everything to him, but when he, got, when he was literally on his way to go apologize and give Arnold everything he was wanting, literally on his way, they intercepted a letter that said Arnold, ha that, that, a letter that Arnold wrote to the British saying, I wanted, I'm switching sides. A fence came in at that last second and now, every person in here raises their hand knowing who Benedict Arnold is, and you all know him as the traitor, right? He's, his reputation has been destroyed, which was the only thing he actually wanted was reputation. <clears throat> so first of all, where was Benedict Arnold living from in this chart? He's living from the soul, right? Obviously. He's not living from the spirit, that's for sure, right? Because what does God say? Right? God says he will exalt the humble. Yeah. Benedict Arnold was the furthest thing from humble that there was. So if you're taking notes, we're gonna, I, I've got five things. This isn't a comprehensive list, but five things that will destroy a person's life. <laughs> Pride, number one. That's the really obvious one because we all know the devil right, and what happened to him. But you look, and that is a live example of what happened with Arnold. Pride got in, right? I want, I want a name for myself. I want the credit. I want reputation. I want blah, blah, blah. 
The Bible is not against, repu- against having reputation. It wants you to have good reputation. That's what Proverbs 22 says, right? Second thing, offense. Offense will destroy you faster than anything. And if you think that you can't get offended, that's really the first step to offense, okay? So people who sit in here and say, well, I'll, I will, I'm, never, I'm not falling to, to offense. Well, the devil was in heaven answering to God himself and managed to fall and bring a third of heaven with him. So you tell me that in this fallen world where, every, where, where you're getting tailgated and yelled at and blah, 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 right? I just drove back from Hot Springs. Goodness, people drive fast. (laughs) Anyways. And they need to learn how to make a left turn. All right, so anyways. (laughs) 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 Um, In this world, if you think you can't get offended, Jesus says that many, many, that, that, that the love of many will wax cold. That is a verse Jesus says when he talks about the end times. He says the love of many money will wax cold. What does that mean? The love, agape, the God kind of love that can only be shown by a Christian, right? Because you have to know God loves me in order to love someone else that way, right? You're not going to love your enemies who are trying to harm you unless you have the agape love, love, right? So he says the agape of many will wax cold. What does that mean? Take a a wick, dip it in the wax, pull it out, let it cool. Dip it, let it cool. It's gradual. It's not just one dump, all of a sudden the love is gone. It's now we're offended about this. Now we're offended about this. Now it gets worse and worse. And pretty soon you get to this point where you're like, what happened? Look at our country. There are people in here that probably remember a time when it wasn't always like this, right? Like Jack. <laughs> just kidding. Just, I love you, Jack. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I always have to make one jab. He, I, I used to, when I was over the cafe, Jack just made jabs. So don't, don't think he's innocent over there. <laughs> I love Jack very much. So, you, but there are people in here that I'm sure remember a time when it was not like this in this world. What happened? We slowly let this in. We slowly let this in. We let this in. This happens on an individual level. It happens on a country. It happens on a church. We let this in now. You got to stop something at, you got to stop it at the, at the door. Okay? Anger, which kind of goes along the lines with offense. Okay? I don't have too much time to get into that because there's one last thing I do want to cover. Fear. Guys, we're not motivated by fear. You guys know that. And actually, this church knows that. I've, we watched what happened when, when fear tried to attack, so I don't even have to cover that because, once again, there is a girl alive because our church didn't respond to fear. I love this church. Finally, complacency. Complacency. Someone else will do it. Uh, I'm sure someone's already thought of that. It doesn't need to be done, right? Yeah. If I'm sure someone's already figured out why that won't work, blah, 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 right? Well, not if God's speaking to you, right? right? Then no one else has thought of it. When Jonah went into that whale, there was no one else. God wasn't sending another person. It was Jonah. And he was to deliver an entire nation. All right. Finally, let's cover the right, the right way to live. Let's go to Joshua 1. Now, I could get into so much with Joshua. That's, uh, I'm reading two, uh, two books right now, and uh, two books of the Bible I'm, I'm spending time in right now, and that's Revelation and Joshua. And it's amazing how connected those are, but I'm not going to cover that. All right. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua. Now, think about this. He's told, you 
are going to be the one who leads us into the promised land, okay? So to lay just a little bit of groundwork, and I don't know if I have time to really cover too much, but there's a verse I want to read. So let me just, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. You can read it. So, <clears throat> um, so here's what's going on. Abraham gives birth, well, he doesn't give birth, that would be weird. Abraham <laughs> and Sarah give birth to the nation of Israel, right? They give birth to Isaac, who then has Jacob. Jacob is Israel, okay? They have children. Joseph then, then gets sold to slavery, ends up in Egypt. Everyone, and, and through there, has this miraculous way of solving a famine, a problem with a famine that he gets told is coming. And because of that, Israel has to go to Egypt to try to get help, and Joseph's able to save the nation of Israel. It's amazing, okay? Side note on that. Uh, I bet you that Joseph would have still had the solution if he wasn't sold into slavery. So they got rid of their problem and then ended up in slavery. What would have happened if they kept him and he solved the problem then? Anyways, that's something fun to think about. Um, so then, fast forward 400 years of slavery, and Moses comes on the scene, delivers everyone. This is a type and shadow of Jesus, okay? Right? We understand types and shadows. It's kind of like something that, it's, it's a, like a prototype, if you will, Right? Moses does what Jesus later will do, right? Joseph, J Moses delivers Israel from the hand of their enemy. Jesus delivers all of mankind from the hand of their enemy, okay? Anyways, so he delivers the nation of Israel. So if Moses is a type and shadow of Jesus, then what would that make his disciple Joshua? Type and shadow of us probably, right? We could, we could look at it that way. There's a few ways to look at it. There's, but... That's probably one that we could accurately assume. And then what does Joshua do? So Joshua, they're, at the, they, they, they're standing there looking at the promised land. They need to enter, but there are enemies in there. So rule number one, your promise doesn't just get handed to you, yep. right? Yep. There's an enemy that that's, wants to keep you from your promise because right. yep. that promise ultimately ends in his destruction. So he has some pretty good motivation to try to stop it, right? So the first thing is that there's an enemy, which surprised some of the people of, of Israel because they sent 12 spies in. They came back. Joshua and Caleb are like, let's go take them. And the 10 of them are like, hold on. There were giants there. God just parted a Red Sea. They're worried about giants, not even knowing the whole time the giants were afraid of them. Read the book. When they get in there, though, all the nations were terrified of when Israel shows up. And they were afraid of the giants, walking by sight, not by faith. Okay? Let's go to uh, Joshua 1.5 real quick. I got time. We're doing good. I do want you to read this verse. So, here's what God tells... So, this is God's... Um, uh, motivational speech <laughs> before Joshua is sent in to go fight and take the, the land of Canaan, which is Joshua's job. Now, Joshua fulfills it, but he walks in humility. Notice the difference between Joshua, and we're going to compare him to Benedict Arnold here, okay? I know that's a weird comparison, but I really want you to see something. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Think that's important in order to inherit your promise? Yes. He says it three times. Be careful. Here's one. This is a rule right here. This is a rule to fulfilling your destiny, okay? So number one, be strong and courageous, okay? So if you're taking notes, number one, be strong and courageous. That can only come through faith with the Lord. You can't be strong and courageous in fear and if you're, if you're looking at circumstances. It doesn't matter what you're facing. I don't care what it is. You can, the Lord can get over it. I promise you. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Nowadays we'd say, be careful to obey the word. Right? There's that word, obey. Number two, submit to the Lord. 
Obey the word. If the word, remember this, if the word says to do something, it should change this. If you read the word and you're like, I don't think it should be that way, then you're not submitted. Okay? Be careful to obey all the instructions. Uh, do not deviate them, turning from the right to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. So there's a promise attached to that. Obeying the word causes true success. Next verse, please. Study this book of instruction continually. Stay in the word. That's how you operate out of this. You stay in the word. Benedict Arnold operates out of this, right? He's more worried about circumstances, everything that goes on. They shouldn't have said this. They shouldn't have done this. You realize that Washington was just as attacked of a character, and he wasn't even seeking personal glory. He had glory, and he gave it up to do what he did because he operated out of this, if you study his life. Meditate on it day and night, thinking on this, right? Right? Meditate like what we do when bills are due, right? That's called meditating. How am I going to pay that? What if I got a second job? What if I, That's called meditating. Don't meditate on that. Meditate on this, okay? Meditate, every, be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed. Remember we talked about right at the beginning, if I only had enough money, then I could focus on this. Now if I only had this much, right? No, it only comes through meditating on the word of God. That's where your solution is. Next verse, please. Adam, Adam, there we go. <laughs> this is my command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a motivational like, go get them, tiger. It's a command. Be strong and courageous. That means it's a choice. God doesn't command unjustly. It's a choice. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's the answer to what you're looking for. We've got to stay off of autopilot. We have to. Yeah. You know, usually, usually it takes a big event to get off of autopilot. Generally, how it works, right? It doesn't have to work that way, but sometimes we let it work that way, right? We kind of get into the day-to-day. -day. And we talked about this a few, uh, about a month ago, right? 9-11, you remember that, right? Everyone's like, same day, same thing, same, blue. and then boom, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what's going on? We woke up to something, right? It shouldn't take a catastrophe to make us wake up, but a lot of times it does. But you know, you can live in a place where that's not how it works. You can live in a place where it's not a catastrophe that wakes you up, it's the word of God. You're only moved by that. That's this church. I don't care what every other church is doing. I don't care what any other church is doing. That's not our company of believers anyway. I mean, they're our body of Christ. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know what I mean. But our company, let's focus here first. Let's get, let's get this figured out. And you know what? Again, this company responded properly. So let's keep doing what we're doing. Okay? Let's take that lesson and let's apply it to our personal lives as well. Okay? All right. And look at that. One minute to spare. Yep, go ahead. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, y'all give me a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. Good word, Matt. Good word. Hey, so just a real preface as to why I called him last night. Thank God for uh, people who are ready in season and out, right? Be ready to share what is richly deposited in you by the word. But I was actually scheduled to teach tonight and Kylie started having contractions last night. And so we were working on a backup plan and yeah, so, uh, and she went to sleep and they stopped and anyway, 
which actually she probably isn't grateful, but uh, we've got two other family members who are grateful because they want to be home before Luke arrives. And they're on their way home tomorrow. I'm sure you guys know that. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just telling you, there's a whole lot, and it's 815s. Why are you? What did I say? I said two what? Oh, three family members. Yes, sorry. Okay, anyway. I'm not sure that Hartley's thinking about baby Luke, although she did talk about him <laughs> last week. She did. So, uh, yeah, so there's a whole lot that I could talk about. I'm going to try to be very precise here uh, so as to not waste time. But uh, all of you that know me know that I've talked and... Okay, hang on. Lord, help me not to cry because I really want to communicate this. It matters where you go to church. It matters the word that you're receiving. It's a matter of life and death. It is. It's a, it, it matters who we connect ourselves with. And so to say that I'm thankful, and I hope that you guys have heard me say this through the years and not just tonight how thankful I am for the people that God has connected our family to. Yeah, amen. And so we love you guys uh, more than you can uh, possibly imagine. But right now, seriously, I want to give God all the praise. I want him to be lifted up and magnified and for, for the God that he is, for people to see that he's the God. Hartley is alive because we serve a God, we believe a God who is nothing but life. Yeah. Right. There is no death in him. Yeah. And, um, and we honor him and we, we, we praise him and we give him all of the glory. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And he is a covenant keeping God. He gives us his word that we can base our lives on, that we can build our lives upon. He doesn't change his mind. Psalms 89, 34 tells us that his covenant, will he not break with us, nor will he alter, he will not alter the things that comes out of his lips. Glory to God. There are promises in his word, and the only thing that he speaks to us is life. The only words he gives us are words of life. So if I could just share two things with you, and I'm not going to, I definitely don't want to steal anything from Court and Landon and anything that they want to uh, share with you guys, but from mom and from grandma uh, and what the Lord has shared with me, I want to take two minutes and share with you. Are y'all good with that? Yeah. All right. So Philippians 1.6 um, there was a day last week that it was just kind of an overwhelming sort of feeling because there were lots of voices, as you can imagine, you know, lots of voices. And uh, I went back to the hotel. Philip went to do something. I said, I've just got to, I've got to get quiet and I've got to hear from the Lord. And, and just sitting there and said, okay, Lord, what, um, what are you saying? I need to hear what you're saying, you know? And so he brought me this verse in Philippians 1, 6, and we know that verse says, He who began a good work in you will complete it. Will, will complete. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Uh, in the message, it reads like this. Um, there's never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. And so as I read that, the, the flourishing part, the flourishing finish is what jumped out at me. That was my word. The good work. There's no doubt in my mind that the good work, this was God's word. It's not my word. It's not hope. It's not wishful thinking. It's not what I want really bad. This is God's word. <laughs> it's going to bring it to a flourishing finish. Spirit, soul, body, relationally, financially, everything. 
nothing missing, a flourishing finish, not only for Hartley, not only for Laney, not only for Courtney and for Landon, all who was affected. Amen. Amen. In their marriage and in their family, not, not, one, not one bit smell of smoke or smell of death. Amen. And I hope and I do believe that you guys know this is God's word. This isn't an amazing pep talk. This is something that you can go out and apply for yourself and believe and expect the same amount of life uh, dealt to you and to your family. Amen. And then the other, the other part of it is the blood of Jesus in Psalms 91. And I know a lot of you hear me talk a lot about that but let me let me say this <laughs> and and I know when when we, you would think about the circumstances and you would think about what what happened you know what let me just encourage you quit thinking about it yeah. Right. Yeah. quit thinking why why even go there in our thought life let's talk about how great God is yeah. what God actually did that day yeah. What God is actually doing. And I'm going to tell you this, as far as the blood of Jesus, that's what I started out with. And I know I've shared this with several of you already, and I have no idea why I'm shaking. I'm just trying to keep it together so I can communicate this. If the blood of Jesus can remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and stand us before a holy God without blame, without guilt, without condemnation, then that same blood can remove any image. I said any image to where there is not even one stain of guilt, of regret, of remorse, of death. And so... That is where we are. We apply the blood of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus is doing the work. There, there's, not, there's not even going to be, I'm just telling you, there's not going to be one ounce of death seen in this family. Spirit, soul, emotions, or financially. Glory to God. 